in this series that we've been doing on spiritual warfare. <laughs> well, what do you expect with a name like Spiritual Warfare? <laughs> I mean, come on, we're all born again of the Spirit, so, you know, what? what's the big deal? I mean, there are people that get so wrapped up into, you know, making spiritual sound so different that we have to get either holy or weird about it. Sometimes I wonder why God deals with this. But in dealing with spiritual warfare, we brought out some of the things that happen in dealing with spiritual warfare. One of them being that, you know, whatever you're full of, it's what you're full of. I mean, uh, you know, if you're full of it, guess what? <laughs> but what you're full of something else, then guess what? <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like whatever's coming out of your mouth, well, that's uh, what you're full of. So, you know, to kind of like avoid the whole problem of having something that, you know, you're not supposed to be saying and doing, then fill it up with something else that you should be saying and doing and you won't do what you do that you did. It was pretty simple, but that was another tape. Then we also talked about how it's kind of like playing possum. You know, Satan likes to play possum a lot. You know, he goes, Oh, you're going to cast me out? You want to throw me out of them? And I got to go because you told me so. So I'm going to go and I'm going to run and I'm going to hide and I'm going to go get seven of my buddies because I'm going to roam around the world and get seven worse that are worse than I am and then we're going to come back and we're going to find out just how real this house has been that you cleaned up and you got all straightened up because you cast us out but we're coming back. I'll be back. And so we learned about that too. <laughs> Satan brings back seven more and so you could... Win the battle, but lose the war. Well, we figured that one out. So, in all these spiritual warfare things, you know, that people like to exercise authority on, you know, they find out that you don't have any authority except that God does, and you don't, and you're supposed to turn it over to Him. And we also figured out that the easiest way to be saved and to stay saved was Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. <laughs> oh, well, you can do it the easy way, or you can do it the hard way, and we figured out that you're going to do it the hard way. Yeah, you will. Because that's just like the way we are. You know, we tend to do things the hard way. So we make up all these religious, you know, symbolic things, you know, to do and cast out water, you know, and pray the censors, you know, and we kind of get our spiritual focus on and then we put on our, ooh, we got to go find the sin in them. You sure? You got it. You're the sinner. You're the problem. Cast you out. Be gone in the name of Jesus. You are not a true Christian. Did you know that the whole idea behind true and false is probably more false than true? Because one of the things that happens in spiritual warfare is that it's pretty simple, you know. You, you don't have to have a genius, you know, IQ to figure out what Satan does or, you know, how he lets us do to ourselves more warfare than we really, he does at all. One of them is divide and conquer. Of course, if you got a problem, tell him what's wrong with the other guy. Hey, you know what? Satan's whispering in your ear. Look at what they're teaching on healing. <gasps> they're one of those. No, they can't be part of the body of Christ. They believe in healing. Really? Oh, no, no. They got sin in their life because they don't believe in healing. Really? Oh, no, they can't be part of Christ because they're normal people. Really? Divide and conquer. You can't be with us because we're with him. And since we're with him, you're over there. Come on. You got fingers. You got fingernails. You got nose hairs. You got nose growing on your hair. Matter of fact, the older you get, the places you find that you got hair growing is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> 
can you drive the car, but and you can't do it. Because you guess what? Everybody goes through the same thing. You get menopause. <laughs> you know what menopause is? It's when a woman pauses on men because she's too hot to handle anything that he's got to do. So if he wants to come over and give her a kiss, she blow up. No, don't touch me. I'm not menopause. I got a hot flash. Divide and conquer. Works every time. And most of the time, the stupidity of it is, is that instead of saying, okay, here's the what we're going to do. No matter what you are or what you do, no matter what you say or how you play, I'm going to take the 12 of you guys. I'm going to take my posse. We're going to put like 12 of you people together. And you know what? You're going to get along because you can't be with me if you don't get along. So all 12 of you got to get along. Father, watch this. <laughs> They're my boys. <laughs> All twelve of them, <laughs> you know, except for the one, and we know about him. But <laughs> watch this. All eleven of them. Watch in no time. They'll be coming up and arguing about who's the greatest. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> what? Huh? Son of Thunder? You want to sit here? <laughs> right. Sure. <laughs> you want to have? Uh, uh, you want to take my place, huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can take my place, but you know what? If you're gonna, if you're gonna walk the talk and, and walk, if you're gonna talk the talk and walk the walk, then you're gonna have to drink. The power drinks like I do. Think about it. You got 12 people who couldn't stand each other. 12. Brothers even. Tell me you go along with your brother. Not. Tell me you get along with your sister. Yeah, yeah, right. Dream on, buddy. Tell me you get along with your own house. Oh, boy, you crossed the line there. The bottom line is that the one thing that Jesus said that would indicate we were his followers was in that you have love for one another. <gasps> I got to love that little turd. I love them, but I don't like them. I love them, but I don't like them. I love them from a distance, but I don't like them. Who let him out? <laughs> so Satan kind of just doesn't really have to do much. He just kind of like throws some things out there that people jump on, like, you know, Holy Spirit stuff. No, we don't believe in Holy Spirit. We do law. Seven days a week. No, we don't do seven. We do Monday. Sabbath. Oh, Sabbath. Sunday. Oh, Sunday. Oh, Monday. Monday. Oh, Tuesday. Oh, Tuesday. Oh, Wednesday. Oh, day. Oh, thank God it's Friday. Ah. Mm. So you see, the stupidity of what we do has already been handled by what God said we should do. And the spiritual warfare is what you do about yourself. Not about what you do about them. Oh, well, you're the problem, not me. Oh, wait a minute, maybe I'm the problem too. Because you see, in as much as you can't get along with someone, then you really can't be his disciple. But as long as you get along with someone, you could be his disciple. Because in as much as you love one another, so you prove... You are my disciples, indeed. Jesus said it. Who let the word out? <laughs> Who let the word out? In other words, the word of God is our assurance and our confidence that we're his. So if you're not doing what the word says, I am not a crook. Then, guess what? You are a crook. You're a hypocrite, like the rest of us. So, you kind of got to do this spiritual warfare dance. You know, you kind of got to go, I am a crook, but I'm forgiven, but I'm a saint, but I don't act like it, 
but love covers a multitude of sins, but I don't love like I should. So I need to be loving. In order to get more loving, I got to ask God to love through me to you. Even if I don't like it. You mean I got to grow up? I don't want to. So we get right or we get left. We get on with it and we move into the blessings of God and become one with the body and bride of Christ so that when Jesus comes for his bride, he takes the bride away. Or if we're not loving, if we're not part of the bride, dare I say we're left behind or maybe we're not ready because we didn't have enough oil. Let's see, what is oil? Could oil be a fruit? Let's see, we got olive oil. Where did olive... We got an olive? Oil come from olives? Is that why they call it olive oil? I thought it was Popeye. Yeah, I think of Popeye. But oil comes from an olive. An olive is a fruit of the olive tree. And guess what the fruit of the Spirit is? Love! <gasps> I'm beginning to see. If I love more of these, then I got more oil in me. So, what's coming out of me is oil. That's an olive that's been crushed. And pulverized. And squished. And heated. And stomped on. <gasps> you mean I gotta get stomped on? In order to really love? Well, anybody could love. I mean, come on now, man. We just... We smoke it, toke it, and we're lovable. But love from God, as he manifested through his Holy Spirit, is a crushed fruit that is produced in you. The world will trivialize you or cause you to go through tribulation that you would be crushed to the point of it being his spirit, his fruit, that would be made real in your life and come outward from you to another person that would be manifested in the oil. Now we got little bitty virgins. Where did little bitty virgins go? Who let the virgins out? <laughs> You're not a virgin. You're not a saint. You're right, I'm not. <laughs> oh well. But we have all these analogies that Jesus gave of like the ten virgins, you know, and five were wise and five were foolish. Five had enough oil, five didn't have enough oil. What kind of oil are they using? Saffron? <laughs> no. Olive oil! It's crushed fruit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's love. Covers a multitude of sins. The love bowl. So, if you want to get on board with what God is doing, and if you really want to get out of here and go on a vacation, you know, like far, far away, so that someday you could be raptured and it may not be that far away, I think you better get ready, because the spiritual deception is one of dividing you from what you're supposed to do, as opposed to what you are doing. Because you see, when you're focused on yourself, trying to... Uh, Clean up your act, then guess what? Self-righteous fool that you are. You think that you can look down at someone else and say, Ha, huh, they ain't ready. Ha, huh, they ain't ready. They ain't going. They don't believe, so they don't go. Man, just because two will be taken, one should be left behind. That doesn't mean that, you know, it's going to be non-Christian and Christian. It's going to be, oh, it's got to be like, a, oh, it is non-Christian and Christian. Oh, well, they were five wise foolish and five foolish, and some of them were ready, some of them weren't ready. They were all looking. Hmm. Maybe it isn't about righteousness. Maybe it isn't about the clothes you wear. Maybe it's about what you have in your underwear. 
I mean, under there. <laughs> Sorry. Wrong word. Wrong <laughs> But if you love like God wants you to love, then you will be tested, you will be crushed, you will be pulverized, he will take your life and squeeze out that oil. Because he wants the Holy Spirit to come out of you, like rivers of living water, to minister to others. Isn't that what a disciple does? But Lord, we want to be yet seated on your right hand and on your left. Well, sure you can. Come on. Sit right here. I'm going to go get crucified. By the way, you get to come along with me. We're going to go get crucified together. Uh, that's not what I got into. I didn't want to do that. I want to inherit. I don't want to get the cost. I just want to get the blessing. Oh, <laughs> yeah, well, there's a little tiny cause. If you could go all the way through this life and love like I loved and have joy like I had joy and do what I did, maybe I'll let you in. Maybe. When we fall away from the blessing that there is in the number of us together in love, knowing that we're all different, remember the 12 disciples, we'll say 11, but there were 12 if you count Paul, or throw in the other one, and not whoever it was in Acts. But if you put them all together, they didn't get along, but they all knew what their salvation was based upon. They didn't blame each other for different ways of looking at things. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Fisherman, but you know what? That, that analogy just doesn't work with us Pharisees, you know, because I got Judas over here. He's telling me something different, you know, and then there's Paul, of course, and he's really got it all screwed up. You know, he's got the unknown God doing unknown things about unknownable things, I think. So they didn't really, you know, see eye to eye, but they had to get along and they had to learn to love one another and eventually, by way of the Holy Spirit coming upon all of them, that brought them into unity. It was not they were in one accord all beforehand and they all agreed, Oh, we are in each other, so now the Holy Spirit can fall. You can't do anything in and of your flesh. I'm sorry. They were in one accord in agreement. That's all. The Holy Spirit made them one. Because he promised. God promised that they would be one. He had already technically made them one by saying, Father, I pray that they be one as you and I are one. And so he'd already done that way before the Holy Spirit came. Way back when he was praying for them, before he got crucified. As far as God was concerned, I said it, it's a done deal. And the same thing is true with you. It is an accomplished fact of your salvation as he is working out in you those things that have become in you that really can't go with you if you want to get out of here. Because if you're kind of hanging on to the flesh, you might be hanging out and dragged down by the world. Uh, I'm being pulled upward, but I'm hanging on to this chair because I ain't going nowhere because I got to see my last episode of Oprah. Huh. I'm addicted. I'm sorry, but, you know, I can't care about Pepsi, you know, because I've got my body flesh addicted to it, and now my spirit can't flee this body anymore because I'm more wrapped up in that than I am in the Word of God. <sighs> okay, Lord, I'm ready to go now. When we choose to walk with God, then he purifies us. He cleanses us. He begins to work these things out of us so that we're ready to go with him when he takes us. If you ain't ready, you ain't going. I'm sorry. He's preparing you. The bride gets prepared. She puts on these beautiful little clothes, you know, and she goes, Oh, I'm all ready. Here I am. Take me. Are you ready? Jesus said, Hey, you know, I'm going to go way far away. By the time I get back, I want you ready. Okay? You got old, I don't know. I'll let you know what day or the hour. But until then, I ain't going to tell you so you're ready. Because if I tell you in five minutes, you're going to make it ten. If I tell you ten minutes, you're going to make it twenty. Because you're going to make it twenty, I ain't going to tell you. So guess what? You don't know the day or the hour because I'm going to surprise you. Well, 
So, in spiritual warfare, the divide and conquer methodology works because it works in us, not because it's from them doing it to us. It's us doing it to ourselves. You yourself know, I know, you have a favorite church. And I don't care what it is. <laughs> it could be the Catholic Church. It could be the Protestant Church. It could be the Methodist Church. It could be the the Church of the, <laughs> of the Redeemed or the Church of Pentecostal or the Church of whatever church. Jesus didn't say, <laughs> oh, well, maybe he did in seven letters to churches. But anyways, thank God he didn't call any of them by specific name today. Close. <laughs> he warned one, you know, he kind of seven hills, you know, it's kind of like there's only one real church that could be. But anyway, so the point being is that, okay, since you got your favorites, is your salvation based upon the church you go to? It could be, but that's not what the criteria is. It could affect you. But the criteria for salvation is a personal determination that you make with God as you walk, talk, live, and breathe, and have your being in Him. For if the Son is found in you, then you are in the Son, and the Father is in you, and you in the Father. If that's true, according to 1 John, you're born again! <laughs> but 1 John also said, <gasps> Wait a minute! He that hates his brother has not the son. No. 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 It doesn't work that way. Sorry. If you hate your brother, you don't got God. If you got God, you love your brother. No. I love you. We go to heaven together. Yay. So you really got a problem. You see, in spiritual warfare, it's kind of like it is. Either you believe God said it, or you don't. Either you know God said it, or you don't go. Hey! I'm going to validate you ticket. Because you know what? If you just go by what was done only, and you don't believe in the Son and what He said, and then He said, and when you get there and He says, I don't know you, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I think we just figured out mm, what did we figure out if Jesus is warning us well it's called a simple story if you love me keep my commandments if you don't you don't What's my commandments? My commandments are easy. My burden is light. What is it? Love. That's easy. It was for me. I died. <laughs> I rose again. <laughs> it's over, man. I did it. <laughs> Your turn. So spiritual warfare, while you're fighting your battles out there trying to blame the devil for what you didn't do, and while you're over here trying to blame your brother for what he didn't do, and when you're over here trying to supposedly save the world for what they haven't done, then you may find out that unless you know that you're loving your brother as Jesus said, that this shall they know that you're my disciples indeed and that you have love for one another, you're missing the boat. You're missing the mark. You're not getting the message. Your salvation wasn't accomplished completely the way it's supposed to be. It may be that you need something more than God spewing you out of his mouth because you didn't know what you were supposed to taste like. And if you want to taste good in the mouth of the Lord, I think you want to have and become a fruit and not a bitter pill. You see, if you're a fruit loop, it kind of tastes good. If you're a fruit of the Spirit, not only does it taste good, gives you good feels inside. <laughs> it tickles. <laughs> no, we're not going to hold after. <laughs> we could. But 
if you become a fruit of the Spirit, peace, love, joy, meekness, temperance, guidance, kindness, then God can use you and crush you and make you into oil that your lamp would be bright and light and lit and causing light to go forth into the darkness. But if you're trying to take your little spotlight and shining upon people and telling them what their faults are and how they're not measuring up, the light you're flashing on the world is a mirror to yourself and your soul. And you were never meant to be a judge. You were meant to forgive. The impartial power of God, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hebrews 10.14 we trample the blood of the Son of God underfoot if we think we are forgiven because we are sorry for our sins. The only explanation of the forgiveness of God and of the unfathomable depth of his forgetting is the death of Jesus Christ. Our repentance is merely the outcome of our personal realization of the atonement which he has worked out for us. We only repent because we figured out that it's a way to get out of hell and get away from sin. Christ Jesus is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. He's made all those things unto us. When we realize that Christ has made all this to us, the boundless joy of God begins. You mean I'm wiser now? You mean I am righteous now? You mean I am sanctified now? You mean I've been redeemed? begins wherever the joy of God is not present the death sentence is at work because you are going to hell if you're not going to heaven <laughs> and God knows you can tell one way or the other simply by whether or not you're dealing with the brethren as brethren or whether you're dealing with them as um, whatever you're dealing with them as it does not matter who or what we are. There is absolute reinstatement into God by the death of Jesus Christ and by no other way. Not because Jesus Christ pleads for us and not because of any other reason, but that he died. Period. It is not earned. It is accepted. All the pleading which deliberately refuses to recognize the cross is of no avail. It is bartering at another door that one which Jesus has opened. I don't want to come that way. It is too humiliating to be received as a sinner. I don't want to accept the fact that I can't do it myself. And I don't want to bring any of them along because, you know what, I don't like them kind of people. They don't deserve salvation. And I'm not bringing those kind of people because they're sinners, you know. And I'm a sinner, yeah, but I'm willing to accept redemption if you just keep all those other people out. There is no other name. The apparent heartlessness of God is the expression of his real heart. There is boundless entrance in this way, his way. We have forgiveness through his blood. Identification with the death of Jesus Christ means identification with him unto the death of everything that never was in him in the first place. So all of our righteousness and our right actions and our right thinking is filthy rags because it was never in him in the first place. Because we couldn't get along with each other and we darn well can't get along with ourselves. 90% of our problems stem from the person who's standing right in front of me. Me. That's the problem with humanity. Me. Not you. Me. I am human. That's the problem. God is divine. That's the problem. In order for me to be divine, the humanity of God had to take the divinity of himself and somehow instill it upon me. And then, even worse, kill me so that the divinity could take over. We call that sanctification and... Well, sanctification, really, because the redemption comes later. But the sanctification is the process of us dying to ourselves, treating our flesh as though no longer liveth, but that Christ liveth in us, and that the Spirit of God has made us alive unto good works and unto righteousness and to holiness and unto love and to being the fruit of what? Father, forgive them. 
for they know not what they do. For we have received grace for grace, mercy for mercy, forgiveness for forgiveness, love to be manifested in us to a world that has no idea what love is. God is justified in saving bad men only as he makes them good. Our Lord does not pretend we are all right when we are all wrong. The atonement is the propitiation whereby God, through the death of Jesus, makes an unholy man holy. You want to know how spiritual warfare works? It's to take the reality of what God did and try to change it and make it into something that it's not. That's spiritual warfare. It's meant to take something that you never had a part of, a battle that happened that you never were involved in, and to try to make the solution into something it isn't. That's spiritual warfare. Because God gave you the solution, and he told you what to do. He said, I have taken care of it. You weren't there in the first place, you won't be there in the end place. But I will provide a way where you will by overcome all of that which has happened to you because of this spiritual battle that happened that you didn't know anything about. And now I will tell you how to win. Here's how you win. Don't do anything. Accept what I have done. Don't do anything. Love as I have loved. Don't fight. Don't go out there and war with warfare that you have no idea to battle with. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not guns. They're not soldiers. They're not weapons. They're not mustard gas. They're not atom bombs. They're more powerful. It's something that could cover a multitude of sins. It's called love, and love can change the enemy into your friend. Love can make the worst of men become the most righteous and holy of people when love will die for the sake of one other one. For this cause shall Jesus come into the world, that God so loved it, that he would manifest the love of God in presenting his body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to his Father, that he would die, that men might live, that we would be likened unto the Son of God, who loved so much that from the very cross he proved he loved his enemies even unto death, which is what we must do. We are Jesus to this generation. We are the Jesus people, Jesus freaks. We are the identification of the personification of who God is to this world right now, in this place, at this time, in your very life. And if you want to know what the spiritual warfare is, it is a denial of who you are in Jesus by Satan lying to you and making you think that you're something you're not, when you should be one of many brethren, all brought into the adoption of the sons of God, unto him for salvation and for the entire world to be saved. If they would just cry out, and we would tell them, this is Jesus. This is what it's all about. Love manifested in God dying for me. If there's one person alive, if there's one person, you can't forgive. You won't be forgiven. I don't want to see you in hell. I don't want you to be deceived by spiritual warfare that blinds you to the truth. I want you to know that Jesus has set you free. He set you free from all your preconceived ideas and religious notions and theologies. He set you free to become His example of love. And that love is demonstrated in that you have love for the brethren. And your brethren are all around you. A lot bigger and a lot more than you realize. For God's sake, for the sake of the world, 
for the sake of Jesus himself, love one another. Even, even as he is loved.